well, that's the direction we're headed, and we've already started that work. And again, that's because of the passage of the bond. And uh, that work's already started. We are, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about in the cell process was Lakeland Elementary and Kingwood Middle School. Both, both were approved for uh, tear down rebuild, meaning that we're not going to remodel them, we're going to take them to the ground and rebuild. We build new school. So we're already starting that process with uh, Lakeland Elementary and then a Tascosita High School. Uh, if you go by Tascosita High School, we're dropping four temporary buildings there every summer, $150,000. So that's why that was on there for the classroom edition. So, so that design work and, and, and looking at that is just going on. The Kingwood area, um, the last, within the last four years, the Kingwood Act facility, uh, we've been on Woodland Hills, has flooded uh, the I mean, they're scrambling to get their animals out, you can't get back in there. And of course, last summer was horrible. So uh, that was on the spot. Purchase land and move that facility, and we are about to close on property, uh, which we're excited about. Ford Road, Mills Branch area up in there. Uh, so we're open, we're close. You know, I gotta be careful in case something falls apart. You're gonna say, I thought you said we're close, we're real close to closing on that property. And you also approved the transportation facility, which that's my one year, but we're also. Uh, Pretty close to the ag land that we're looking at purchasing, uh, about 11 and a half acres for a transportation facility. And let me tell you why that's important. Because if our director of transportation tells us if I can get if I can get close to 100 buses in Kingwood, that's two million dollars a year in savings. So that's how important. That is. And so that's why that was on there, and we're that close. So it's the same family, so we're getting close. We've started uh, turning our high school football fields. And one of the reasons you can start on that, that's a pretty easy project as far as design to get done. And you have to remember, it's not just football. It's also <coughs> FTC, band, cheerleading. I mean, there's, we're hoping to, that our community, you know, we've, we've uh, been asked before by some of our little leagues, hey, can you use your field, the way it's grass, that's hard. Here's the season, the soccer using them, and it just wears on. So this is really going to be a cost savings, and it's going to be a, it's going to allow us to actually open up. Yeah, the leagues, you want to use our facility? Absolutely. This is this belongs to the community. And so now that we'll be able to do that. So real excited those are going. Obviously, uh, we've got you know Wi-Fi, uh, security cameras, technology, all of that. That will always be, you know, that's one of the things we talked about. <laughs> As we presented on the bond, the technology, as you all know, in your world, it, it, you just can't keep up with it. And so it will always be an ongoing need. And so we've already started that. Uh, our director of technology, working on the Wi-Fi, uh, reliability, all of that, that's already taking place. And that's because we made the bond, which is awesome. So those are things that you don't necessarily see, but when you're a student in the classroom or a teacher, and you prepare, and it's not working, that hurts. And so those are things that are exciting for our staff and our students. So we'll continue to look at uh, how we wrap these projects together. Again, it's $575 million. We've got $125 million. We're going to start working on immediately. Those are some of the projects. And we're going to continue to look at how do you bundle these. And we work with architects and project managers. They'll allow us to help us shape those so that, like, so for example, when you do, uh, if you were to do the multi-purpose rooms at the elementary school, you can bundle those where you get a bigger bang for your buck. And so those are the kinds of things we're working on right now. So that is where we are with that. Any questions on the bond or anything before I start advertising our 100 years? <laughs> I know, is that not amazing? We've been around 100 years, and we look good. <laughs> so this is um, something that we're really excited about to be a part of. I've got two minutes, and then I'll be part of that so much. My wife would just be doing this. <laughs> OK, so um, anyway, it's 100 years. We're really excited about that, and we're really excited about that. We're here at the 100-year celebration of Umbelias D. 
And so uh, there will be things going on all year long. We'll be getting things home from schools about celebrations. But we're going to kick it off August 25th at the Emblem Civic Center. And it's going to be a true pep rally celebration. A uh, band's going to be there, uh, 59 North, uh, putting on a concert. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be, uh, I've been told, cold front's going to come through. <laughs> <laughs> so get your boots and jackets out. <laughs> but we hope you'll be a part of that. You come by the high schools, the elementary, they're going to be engaged and really celebrating. It's going to be a fun event. And uh, it's going to be a fun year. It's going to be a fun, dry year. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right, well, if there's any questions, thank you all for letting us get an update. We'll continue. If you have a question in the back, that's 99 years. What is it? Uh oh. I didn't mention that. It's, it's the 100 year celebration. It is the 100 year celebration. I will point that out though when I get back. Y'all are a school district? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 100 year celebration. It's just a year. Right. Come on. That's right. It is a whole year thing. Thank you very much. Kick off. It is the kickoff. 100 years. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because we have got details on that. And so we'll have a we have a safety committee and we'll look at that. One of the things we're gonna do is all the ISV has had metal detectors for a long time. And um, we're gonna go after Labor Day, kind of get school settled because we really want to see how that works. Especially at the high schools. How do you get, you know, two thousand to three thousand students through metal detectors? in a timely fashion. They've been doing it. We just want to go see it and study it and see how it works. So that's, yeah, that's still out there. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. I like that you said it's going to be a dry year. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. That leads us right into uh, flood mitigation. <laughs> I like that transition. So with us today, we have uh, Chuck Gilman, who's the Director of Flood Management for San Jacinto River Authority. They, you and your team have been extremely busy um, working to keep us uh, safe and dry and sound. So do you, would you like to use the mic or do you want to yell like everybody else? I'll just yell. Okay. okay. You guys can hear me. Is that okay? <laughs> yep. Great. Great. I appreciate you guys having us here this morning. Uh, I see a few familiar faces. Uh, I came on board with the uh, River Authority about three months ago in response to the governor's request that the San Jacinto Authority get more involved and engaged in flood management. So, uh, I have a background in civil engineering and public administration, experience in consulting, design work, construction, and city management. So. Um, I'm fortunate enough to head up this division, and so we have uh, several challenges um, and um, initiatives that we're focused on. Some of them are short-term and long-term strategies to assist in flood mitigation. Um, so I'll talk about those today. That's primarily what I want to discuss is our short-term and long-term strategies for flood mitigation. We're also looking to build partnerships um, with federal and state agencies to help us in this effort. Um, if Corinne would be kind enough to have me back on another day. I would love to come and talk about the watershed as a whole. Um, we heard a lot about releases from Lake Conroe. The majority of the water that drains into Lake Houston does not even come from Lake Conroe. It comes from other watersheds. So I'd love the opportunity to come back and visit you a little bit more about the watershed. But in order for us to be effective, we have to have those partnerships. That's those partnerships are coming into play. And our third challenge is funding funding sources. <coughs> we do not receive any funds at all from the state, we do not get ad warrant tax or sales tax. We function very similar to a private water utility. We generate revenue from the sale of raw water to industry and treated water to um, municipalities and uh, other utility issues. So some of our short term strategies this is a joint operation strategy that we are implementing with the city of Houston, where the city of Houston is looking and doing 
pre-releasing of water from Lake Houston as the storm approaches. And we're taking a different approach. And Lake Conroe, we're further up in the watershed, so what we're trying to do is implement a temporary seasonal lake lowering of, of one foot in the spring and two feet in the fall. So Lake Conroe was built by the city of Houston as a water supply reservoir. It does not have a lot of flood control storage and capacity. So what we're trying to do is provide a little bit of storage for uh, the downstream area. So what we, our board has agreed to, the city of Houston has agreed to, and TCQ has agreed to, is one foot lowering in the spring and two feet in the fall. You may have seen the press release that came out yesterday. We started releasing water from Lake Conroe yesterday. It's going to rave about 150 cubic feet per second. So as it comes down the river, you might see an inch increase in the river. It is not significant. Um, but our goal was to reach an elevation of 200, <coughs> one foot low, August 15th, and 199 by the end of So that would give us two feet, which in terms of total volume capacity is about 38,000 acre feet of water or storage there. So that's one of our short term strategies we're working on right now. I want to shift here just a little bit and talk about some of the projects that we have. We have uh, three main projects that I want to talk about. One of them is ongoing. One of them we have applied for a grant for through the Texas Water Development Board. And the last one is a partnership with Harris County Flood Control District, <coughs> City of Houston, and Montgomery County that we're looking for federal funding support for. Uh, the first study is, uh, is it, all this is in the West Fork of the St. Jacinto River. And this study is about 80% complete. So what we did as part of this effort was <coughs> enhanced flood um, uh, early warning systems, and then we updated some of our uh, modeling data. So on the flood enhancement systems, we have rain gauges out in the network that collect data and information and they send that information back to our office and that information is posted on our website. So we have about 15 to 20 gauges out in the watershed and that information can be accessed on the website. So what we what we did as part of this effort is when we upgraded all that hardware out in the field, upgraded the software back to the office and ensured that communication system. Um, we're going to build on that in phase two. I'll talk about that in just a minute. The other part of this project was updating what we call H and H models, hydrology and hydrologic models. Um, the hydrology piece is how much rain falls in the watershed, how quickly does it get to a conveyance system like a creek or a river. And the hydraulic modeling says how quickly does that water move down the creek or the river as it passes by bridges and culverts and road crossings and other encroachments into the floodplain. So we update a lot of those data which gives us a better idea of when water falls in the watershed, how quickly will it get to the lake, and how does that affect our releases as we make sure our reservoir operates within its operating range. So this is about 80% complete. We partnered with Montgomery County and the city of Conroe on this effort. There's other localized areas in Conroe that had some drainage issues. Uh, this one's wrapping up. The second phase of this project we want to build on, we submitted a grant to the Texas Water Development Board in July, requesting a little over a half a million dollars. They then say, great, we give you a half a million dollars, you need to go find a half a million dollars of your own money. So it's a 50-50 match. But what we want to be able to do is to build on what we did in phase one in the phase two study. So there were several communities, MUDs, in the Woodlands Township area that had serious flooding after Hurricane Harvey. So they said, look, we want you guys to focus on an area of spring creek. So if we provide the local match, will you chase these dollars to the Texas Water Development Board? We said that's a great project. So Spring Creek would provide benefit to the Woodlands area. Spring Creek is a watershed that is not upstream of Lake Conroe Dam, but it does drain directly into the Lake Houston area. So there would also be a benefit to the Lake Houston area if we're successful in this grant. Um, what we want to do in the Spring Creek area is not necessarily update the models or go in and, and create a bunch of paper reports. What we want to go do is actual site and study. Let's go out on the ground using aerial photography, tax based land data, and find out is there land available, undeveloped, rural land that has the right topography and the right characteristics to build a flood control reservoir. So this would be a, a thousand plus acre reservoir that would function similar to Addicts and Barkers, it would be dry unless there's a rainfall event, at which point it would detain water, not retain it, but detain it, so it would fill the water and be a slow release over the next five, seven, ten days, whatever that design looks like. The second piece of this, as I mentioned, we want to build off what we 
talked about in phase one. So we upgraded <coughs> in our watershed all these rain gauges. So now we have better data, more reliable data, and a better communication system. So as part of phase two, we'd like to develop a program or an algorithm that will go and pull updated weather forecasts from National Weather Service website. It goes and it pulls rain data out of each of those gauges. It monitors the lake level. It looks at our current gate positions and then tells us, okay, if all this holds steady, if the weather forecast is accurate, your models you just updated in phase one are accurate, you know the rainfall that's coming in, here's where we expect the lake to crest. So that will help us to make decisions on how to operate the gate. How much water can we hold back? How much do we need to release? Are there ways that we can function and monitor, engage that release so that we don't have adverse impacts downstream? <laughs> that's our second study. The final study, I'm sorry, that's our Spring Creek um, study. This kind of shows the, the area. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Here's the watershed. The Lake Conroe is further up here at the top. And obviously, Lake Houston is down here in the corner. It's our forecasting tool. Our regional watershed study. This is the third project. Um, that we're involved with. This is a partnership between Harris County Flood Control District, City of Houston, um, Montgomery County, and SGRA. Um, we're looking for federal funds for this. TNM, Texas Department of Emergency Management, um, has uh, offered to pay up to 75% of the study. These funding partners are making up the local match. And what we're trying to do is to update the models on all of the watershed, not just the West Fork, but a lot of other watershed that drain down into the Lake Houston area that have an impact on Harris County. That is why Flood Control is interested in this project. But it will look at all of these watersheds, the East Fork, the West Fork, Loose Bayou, Peach Creek, Payne Creek, Tarkington Bayou, Lake Creek. This is the watershed. I'd like to, at some point, if you guys are interested, I'd have to come back and talk about the watershed and how it functions. But all this area that you see will be the area of study and it all drains right down here to Lake Houston. So um, that, that's the purpose of the regional study. And that's why I talked about part of the presentation. Is this is not something the River Authority can do alone. What we control is this release right here. We control what comes out of the dam, but we have no control over the water that falls, the water that's retained in Lake Creek, Peach Creek, Parkton Bayou, Spring Creek, Cypress Creek. Um, that's why it truly is a partnership. This study will actually cost about $2.7 million. The goal is to go in and update all of the H&H &H models for this entire watershed. There will be a lot of IR data, topography data that's collected aerially, uh, electronic data will update models. That model will help us better understand the amount of water that's making its way down to the Lake Houston area and how quickly it's getting there. The other part of the study would be to evaluate five previously identified infrastructure improvement related projects. And so this, this is not the first time the area has been studied. Um, there's been a lot of efforts and, and discussions about other reservoirs, other impoundments, channel improvements. <coughs> this study will review those five previously identified and then talk about uh, five to four to five new projects. Um, this will be about a 12 month effort. Um, and will involve not only flood control in the city of Houston, but also Montgomery County. Dredging, I'll just mention briefly that we are involved and participate with the Corps on the, on the dredging project. I understand we have a speaker who's going to cover this in depth, so I'm going to move past this. The last topic that I want to mention about to you today is debris removal. The city of Houston has um, hired a contractor, and although this is not our contract, not our effort, we are involved in coordinating with them as some of the activities that take place on the West Fork and the East Fork. They have a contractor that is actively removing vegetative debris in and around the Lake Houston area within 20 feet of the shoreline and working their way up the East and West Fork. And so uh, we've had some recent conversations with them about the possibility of extending that contract whereby the city of Houston would sign an interlocal agreement with the River Authority and then we would help manage that effort further upstream as those efforts would be outside of Harris County and Montgomery County. So that's all I've done in the last three months. <laughs> 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 um, that's all I have. I'd be happy to add to any, answer any questions or if there's additional information you'd like to hear at a later date, I'd love to talk to you. Yeah, we would love to. Are you able to stay?
active construction site. It is a dangerous site. It's, it's controlled. And we're making an appeal out to the community just to, try to make efforts to refrain from driving out there in that little narrow one-way uh, area into that and just go sightseeing. Because it's very interesting, very exciting to see this kind of uh, activity. Um, at, the, at the core down in Galveston, it's, it's tantamount to like building the pyramids, okay? It's a lot of activity. Uh, and the, our biggest concern is safety for the community and not to uh, impede the progress of one of the nation's largest dredging companies, which is Great Lakes Dredge and Dock out of Illinois. Uh, so what happens is in this area, this is a sort of like, uh, very narrow area. These roads are semi-improved. Uh, next week, you're going to see approximately 200 trucks moving large, heavy equipment into this area. Uh, when we announced the award of the bid on 11 July, uh, what happened was this company has a, a window in which to perform uh, or accomplish the dredging activity, the emergency dredging activity, and they own a very tight schedule. So what happens is, is that uh, on the 27th, which was Friday, and I'll show you some, some images in a moment, they were on the ground running. So what happens is that at this staging area, um, you'll begin to see, let's see, there it is. The staging area, this is just the recent work that occurred within <coughs> six days. We had 100 loads of stone uh, placed in that kind of muddy, marshy area out there, so heavy equipment and trucks can be able to ingress into that area. We also have about 18 trucks of pipe 
and I'll show you about the 600 uh, pipes that are laid out in that staging area. Uh, there's a lot of truck activity, bringing in heavy equipment, 150 trucks move in and out of that area. Uh, and there's approximately 30 personnel uh, uh, working in that area. The Corps' role is quality assurance. Uh, there was a contract that was placed out that says, look, these are the things you can't do. Uh, these are some of the concerns we have from the community, and it's our role to just do quality control and make sure that, uh, that they'll follow the specifications. I'd encourage folks that if you have questions uh, or concerns, then please share them with myself or our office or work with your local uh, leaders here in the community and share those with us so we can work. We can't maybe not be able to answer the question the way you want to, but we'll definitely try to look into it, try to mitigate any kind of friction or any kind of problems. So this is what's happened over the last week. You can see there's a lot of activity. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so what, again, we're asking from, you can see, because uh, folks like to go out there and take a look, there's still felled trees, there is damage from Hurricane Harvey in that area. You can see yesterday when I went out there, uh, you can see the long line of trucks. Uh, in this case, you know, you have dangerous active construction. What this is, this is a, a barge. They kind of put them together like lo uh, Legos. So you can see if that crane were to tip or that something were to snap or break, it would be pretty catastrophic. So what's happening on our next slide, you can begin to see. Okay. Um, these flex, flex slopes will be positioned within uh, the San Jacinto River. So what does that mean to you? If you'd like to get out in your express boat, Say, look, I'm just going to go down the San Jacinto River. You need to be aware that there's going to be some risk there, especially with these uh, portable barges that link together. So you can see that uh, that's another concern that we have is that there's also a pipeline. There'll be pipes that will be submerged in the San Jacinto River. And what these pipes do, you'll have a dredge that will excavate the material. Uh, it will then push that material, uh, shoaling, debris, or sediment through a system of pipes. These are polyethylene pipes. Uh, these things are 24 inches in diameter. Uh, so what our concern is, is that they'll be marked with buoys. Uh, there'll also be dredging activity out there. Uh, it, it won't occur in the next two weeks. They'll assemble those dredges in the next two weeks. But probably around the end of the month, you'll start to see these things out there. So uh, you can see this is a pipe farm that's uh, being laid out. It was really impressive to look at that. All right. So as far as boating safety, uh, the United States Coast Guard was notified, and there is a notice uh, to navigators out in that area. Uh, the, the center photograph is an example of what one of these barges will look like. What the challenges we have with dredging is that a, much, a lot of times what happens, dredges are, you'll see them along the Gulf Coast, intercoastal waterway, they're floated. In this case, they have to be disassembled placed on about 24 trucks, trucked in to Houston, up to that little narrow way down Houston Avenue, and then reassembled. Okay, they have to put the thing back together. And if you've seen some of these, these, these dredges, you know, they're, they're complex, they're complex vessels. So once we put the thing back together, we've got to launch it into the river, and then what you'll see, if you're out there boating, you'll see these buoys, and that's just an indication that there is an underground pipe. And already, some of those areas, I think when we went out there on a survey, I personally got in the boat and went out there. You know, there's times we had to get out of the boat in order to... to, to.